Hi, I'm Lindsay, um, in case all those names confused you. Uh, I'm not quite sure why I'm doing two, but never mind. Uh, but I'll do one introduction, not two. So um, I have uh, various jobs, various uh, mostly teaching jobs. I, I'm a teaching fellow at London School of Jewish Studies. Um, I teach a bit at Cambridge, I teach a bit at Oxford. Um, I teach at local synagogues. I, and then people say, and what do you teach? Uh, I do a lot of text. I do a lot of Bible, Mishnah, little bits of Talmud, Midrash. Uh, I teach about Jewish prayer. And I also teach interfaith stuff. So I have done Introduction to Christianity for Jews and Introduction to Islam for Jews, which uh, have been great hits, actually. You might be glad to know. And, um, and uh, yes, I'll teach anywhere. I'll teach anything. I don't do, the philosoph don't do philosophy and I don't do the Holocaust. But apart from that, I'll do anything, just about. Uh, anything else I should say? Um, I have an intimate acquaintance with the Church of England. I went to a Church of England boarding school and was forcibly dragged to Truro Cathedral every Sunday for eight years. Uh, <laughs> I have a less close uh, interaction with, with Islam, but I do quite a lot of Jewish Muslim uh, text study days and interfaithy things. So uh, I have learned a lot more than I used to know. And uh, first time at Greenbelt. Right, that's probably about enough, I think. Uh, <laughs> And the first of my two topics is the Sabbath, or Shabbat, in Hebrew. And I just can't call it the Sabbath, because to me that has connotations. I don't know of a sort of 19th century Presbyterian event in Scotland. <laughs> Whereas, uh, <laughs> not to be rude to any Presbyterians, but for me, Shabbat, Shabbat is something very special indeed. And uh, the first thing to say is for Jews, it depends where you are in the Jewish spectrum as to what your Shabbat looks like. But I would say just about everybody's within the bounds of the Jewish people, and I'll talk about that in my second bit, um, has some concept of what Shabbat means to them. And it may vary enormously. So uh, I come from, I suppose, a modern Orthodox background, and I'll be talking principally about how I experience Shabbat. But it's important to recognize that not all Jews observe Shabbat in the same way. Uh, so some are more guided by traditional Jewish law. Some are more guided by uh, the atmosphere or their family traditions. But just about everybody has some special thing that says Shabbat to them. It may be food, it may be what you do do, it may be what you don't do, it may be time with the family, it may be time studying, all sorts of things. But there is this vast range. I'll speak principally of my own uh, experience, but I'll try and include a little bit of other things too. Now, uh, Shabbat uh, is a Jewish day, which is to say it starts in the evening and it ends in the evening. A little bit before sunset and ends a little bit after sunset. So it's actually 25 hours, Friday evening to Saturday evening. And each part of Shabbat has a flavor, has a, has a sense to it, has a, a feel. Friday night, there's the Oh, my heavens, we got through another week. There's the, the deceleration, which in mem certain members of my family means falling asleep on the sofa. Um, there's a, a feeling of infinite time stretching in front of you. Uh, there are the rituals that accompany bringing Shabbat in. People talk of making Shabbat. It's something you make. It doesn't happen on its own. Uh, you make Shabbat. So there's the pre-preparation. Um, and I once saw in a friend's house in Israel a marvelous little tile that said in Hebrew, he who uh, exerts and exhausts himself on the eve of, Sabbath, of the Sabbath is tired on the Sabbath, which is uh, very unfortunately true. I think the sort of payoff was expected to be, you know, reaps all the rewards. But very often you do start off with a sense of exhaustion if you've been rushing around to get it ready. But the moment it comes in... Uh, there's again, people will sometimes bring it in at the, the halachic time, the Jewish legal time, which is about 18 minutes before actual sunset. Some people bring it in at a sort of slight variations. The most common way of bringing in the Sabbath is to light two candles. Many households, this is done by the woman. Uh, if man's living on his own, he'll do it himself. But that moment where you light the Sabbath candles with the blessing, you step back, you look at the candles, and then there's this, ah. Oh, and the cares of the world are off your shoulder. Again, this varies in practice, but certainly traditional Sabbath observance, you don't do any form of creative work. It's not just work. The Hebrew word is melacha, which is different from the Hebrew term for labor, which is avodah. And a melacha is a creative type of work. It's nothing to do with the effort. If I wanted to fill a backpack with stones and run up and down the stairs on the Sabbath, I could do it. 
It would not be in the spirit of Shabbat necessarily, but technically, legally, I could do it. However, if I want to write one letter, I can't do that. Or if I want to flip a light switch, I can't do that. So creative work includes all sorts of agricultural work, uh, all sorts of cloth making work, all sorts of building work, and their derivatives. And the rabbinic tradition links these 39 types of prohibited activity to the 39 types of activity used for building the desert tabernacle, which I'm sure you've heard of um, in the Pentateuch. And uh, th so this is idea that it's a creation that ceases, uh, very much linked to the creation story. God works for six days to, the, to create the word, and on the seventh day, Shavat Vihinavash, he rested and resold himself, whatever that means. So it's an imitation of God. And it's an, it's an idea that we are, in our microcosmic way, reflecting the macrocosmic action of God. God creates a universe and has a space. We create our lives. We have a space. So the prohibitions don't seem onerous. Um, it's not a matter of you can't, you can't, you can't. It's much more of making space so you can, you can, you can. And traditionally, Sabbath is a time for nice meals, relaxation, prayer, study, family, sleep, walking around, playing stupid games with the kids, chatting to friends. It's very expensive. Um, no electronic communications. Bliss. It's all just turned off. No extra little bits of work. No, I can't do it. I know it's due yesterday. Tough. God says I can't do it. I've got no responsibility for it at all. I can just relax because there's nothing I can do about it. It's remarkably liberating. And Abraham jo uh, Joshua Heschel, a uh, 20th century great rabbinic figure, uh, it wrote a whole book called The Sabbath, which I strongly advise you to read. Very small little book in which he speaks of it as being a sanctuary in time. And it is this little marvelous place carved out of the hurly-burly of the rat race where it's not up to you. It's not up to you. There are parameters. Uh, you can do what you like within those parameters. But there it is. You don't have to make excuses. You can just turn everything off and walk away. And there's something remarkably restful, liberating, reinvigorating about that. It also means, of course, that if you've got stuff you love to do and you don't have time during the week, you can lie and read. You can study Talmud. You can, as I said, play with the kids. You can go to sleep. And it's lovely knowing that it comes around week after week after week. And it becomes very internalized. You fall into patterns. It's an automatic thing. When my children were very, very small, I remember being quite amazed that the six-year-old got up in the middle of the Friday night to go to the loo and didn't turn the light on because though she was half asleep and sleepwalking to the bathroom, Shabbat was inside her. I didn't need to say anything. I wouldn't have, but uh, I didn't need to. Her body knew, all of her knew, every cell of her being knew it was Shabbat. It was a qualitatively different day. And that's something really, really special, really exciting. Um, and it reinvigorates you for the whole week. It's, it's like charging your batteries. It doesn't matter what you're going to do in the week. You've had that day that you've celebrated, whichever way you choose to celebrate it. It just gives you that rump to go forward. So it's a, it's a beautiful experience. It's never, ever been a negative experience. I think the only times I've had a ne negative experience of Shabbat was when I was somewhere where I was the only person making Shabbat, and I suddenly felt quite isolated. And there it became a question of coping. You know, how do I manage till the sun gets down without putting the light on? How do I manage in a, in a whole group of people who have no idea I'm doing this? Um, Things like being in hospital or, or looking after a relation, something like that. And there it be can become less joyful simply because you're so isolated with it. And, and, and it can be a little bit difficult to negotiate. But in every other context, it's a pure joy. And there's, uh, I talked about the changing moods, the sort of complete relaxation and maybe sleepiness on the Friday night, the access of energy on a Saturday morning where you might or might not go to synagogue and have friends around for lunch, the re-resty bit of the afternoon, where, which is the time when you have your little traditional nap or you do a bit of study or you have the walk, you take the kids to the park, and then... As it goes out, the slight sadness, this feeling of not, sort of nostalgia almost, as, as you realize the whole world is there. You're going to hear what the news was. You know, it's also a day without news. It's wonderful. And that slight aura of sadness with which the Sabbath goes out, we actually um, 
have a ritual for ending the Sabbath called Havdala, separation, during which we light a double wicked candle, we smell spices, uh, recite a blessing over wine. Uh, it's quite a little short ceremony, but there is an air of slight sadness to it. And uh, tradition says that the reason we smell the spices is we are granted an extra soul on the Sabbath. And as it departs, that extra soul goes and we sniff the spices to revive the soul that's got to struggle through another six days before it gets another taste of Shabbat again. And um, how am I doing for time? Almost there? Two minutes, right. Another rabbinic image that I think uh, gives you an idea of, of Shabbat is it's described as me'en holam, olam haba. It is a taste of the world to come. And though Judaism has a, a strong concept of the world to come, it's short on details. Uh, various rabbinic pictures describe the world to come as an eternal study session with God leading the study of his own Torah, uh, which is going to be exciting. Uh, there are various, uh, there's a sort of possibly a heavenly banquet with the Leviathan, the Leviathan being served up. Um, who knows? Uh, these are all on the rabbinic level and, and perhaps uh, maybe more metaphorical than actual. But if uh, we're told that the Sabbath is a is, is a foretaste of the world to come, that's rather nice because Shabbat is very much what you make it. As I said before, you make Shabbat. So maybe the world to come is going to be like that too. But maybe that sense of relaxation, of security, of lack of choice, which can be quite nice. Lack of choice, which creates a framework for you to find what you need, to, find, to redefine your relationship with God, to redefine your relationship with other people. Maybe that is what the world to come is going to be like. And if so, I'm looking forward to it tremendously. I think that would be very, very nice indeed. One eternal Shabbat with no washing up. I think that could be very, very good indeed. The other thing is, of course, it is one day out of six. And there's a very strong sense of the other six days are equally necessary, otherwise it wouldn't be Shabbat. Perhaps the world to come is necessary, is, as needs as a complement this world, otherwise it wouldn't be the world to come. So there's a certain interplay between the weekdays and Shabbat. There's a certain sense of leading up. People will say, on the Wednesday, I'm planning the Shabbat menu. On the Sunday, a friend of mine told me, I start making my Shabbat salads, which are complicated, and I like to have them ready in advance. Uh, there's the calling around of friends, who's going to come this week, who have we got coming this, where are we going? So there's a certain anticipation. And the days of the week in Hebrew have no names like Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. They are first day, second day, third day, fourth day, fifth day, sixth day, Shabbat, which shows you where you're going to. Uh, so it's the first day after Shabbat, the second day after Shabbat. The whole of the week is conceived of in this counterpoised relationship with Shabbat. So... Um, I'm not sure what your own practice would be for a Christian Sabbath, and I am sure it varies between denominations, between individuals. I have had, uh, when I lived in Israel, uh, we used to have Christian guests who would visit our synagogue and come home for a Friday night meal. And one of them once wrote to me back from Germany and said that they had been so struck by aspects of Shabbat that they had incorporated it into their own Christian practice, and they had adopted elements here and there that they, helped, they, felt, uh, they felt made them a little sanctuary in time once a week. So I hope perhaps some of those ideas might give you something to draw on and adapt and incorporate and make your Sunday or whichever day you're choosing to celebrate particularly a source of spiritual growth and regeneration and excitement for the week ahead.